Having developed a framework for uh, time-dependent perturbation theory, we're going to now explore some commonly occurring types of uh, time-dependent problems and uh, study how they affect transitions between states. So we've previously seen that the probability amplitude of transitioning from a state cat i to a final state cat f with uh, respective energies ei and ef uh, we're given oh, due to a perturbation that we're calling delta H T. So in general, some time dependent perturbation. This was given to first order by the following expression. Here, the bounds of integration are uh, the limits at which the perturbation is turned on and then turned off. Uh, and omega F I is the, um, the angular frequency of a uh, photon that will be emitted or absorbed between a transition uh, between these two states. This delta H is the, the matrix element of our operator uh, delta H hat between the states I and state F. And the interest in and this quantity is that if you take the square modulus, you get the probability of uh, being in state F at some given time t, given that you started in uh, state I. So we'll first consider uh, a, uh, a perturbation that is solely turned on to some steady state value which is the limiting case of what was previously mentioned that any perturbation has to be turned on at some point, which called into question the validity of time independent perturbation theory. Uh, so to see that, to explore that scenario a little bit, we have, uh, We're going to have a, a perturbation that's slowly turned on up to some uh, steady value, which means it's time independent. And we'll say uh, for simplicity, we'll say that it gets turned on at time t naught equals to zero. The form of the perturbation will then look something like this. So it's zero before it was turned on, before time zero. And it's being turned on with some rate k for time less than, uh, greater than or equal to zero. This delta V hat is a time independent operator. Uh, it may depend on position, just as uh, some of the perturbations with, we saw in time independent perturbation theory did. Uh, K here is the rate at which uh, we turn on the perturbation. Okay, and what that means then is k is some constant that's greater than zero. We'll call this uh, equation one. And what this looks like then is as a function of time, this is this delta v hat. Uh, it will, after some time, reach this maximum amplitude. And this is oftentimes the case in, uh, in experiments. It's very difficult to instantaneously, in the true sense of the word, turn on a perturbation. Every, every perturbation has to be gradually turned on to some extent. So we'd like to see what our results from time-dependent perturbation theory, uh, namely this one, give when we consider this type of perturbation. Right, so we want to 
calculate this probability amplitude of uh, being having started in some state i and what would be the probability of being in state f at some point in time later we'll call that point in time t okay so uh, given our formula we need the matrix element of our perturbation uh, this would be this part because this is the only part that will act on the on the states i and f we have the i h bar in the denominator integral from zero to t this is when we turn on the perturbation and we're observing the system at some time t later This is our time dependent part of turning on the perturbation. And uh, the complex exponential term that we had here before. Okay. This one, I was able to, again, take it out of the integral because it doesn't depend on time. So here, this quantity is the matrix element of this delta v hat operator. And this is uh, using equation one that we had over here. So uh, performing the integration, we get something that looks as follows. So this is our expression for the probability amplitude of being in state f at some time t later. And what we're going to do now is we're going to look at uh, times uh, much longer than the time it takes to fully turn on the perturbation. So we'll look somewhere far away over here once the perturbation has reached steady state for a while. And we're also going to take the limit that the perturbation was uh, slowly turned on. Okay, so for uh, times much, much greater than uh, one over the rate. So this gives a characteristic time, the scale of a characteristic time to turn on the perturbation. And this just means for long times after the perturbation has been turned on. And uh, to quantify what we mean by slowly turning on the perturbation is with respect to the transition frequencies of the system we're looking at. So the rate squared uh, has to be much, much smaller than the angular frequencies of the transitions squared. In that case, the probability of having gone from state I to state F after some time t, this is given by the square amplitude of the coefficient we calculated before. It's given by uh, this expression. All right, so what does this mean? Well, if you uh, recall our result from time independent perturbation theory, which I'll call uh, TIPT for short. The uh, first order correction to our state was a sum over every other state except the one we were looking at.
of the analogous matrix element that we have over here. over the energy difference between state K and the state we're looking at, which is equivalent to uh, this quantity, right? This is H bar omega Fi squared. This is the, um, this quantifies the energy difference between our final and our initial state. And then we had summed over all of these states. So, the coefficient that we found over here is completely equivalent to the coefficient that we had in the first order uh, correction to the state from time independent perturbation theory, which had assumed that we had some uh, time independent perturbation that had always been turned on. So in the limit where we gradually turn on a perturbation uh, and we look much, much later in time after the perturbation has been turned on for a while, we get the same result as in the case where we assumed that, or an analogous result to the case where we assume the perturbation had always been turned on. Uh, you have to be a bit careful here with the interpretation of this. Um, while these coefficients are the same, uh, I would say physically, you have to be a bit careful with their interpretation because time independent perturbation theory can't say anything about transitions as they are inherently a dynamical process. Uh, however, having gotten the same result with, or the same expression for a coefficient of a given state from time independent perturbation theories with it for the time independent case shows that we're often justified in uh, being able to use time independent perturbation theory, even though technically there is no such thing it's a true time independent perturbation. Okay, so the conclusion or the main takeaway from this is uh, if a perturbation is turned on at a rate uh, k that's much, much smaller then the frequencies associated with usually atomic or molecular transitions, which we're calling omega fi. So the difference in energy essentially between state f and state i then uh, for long enough times the transients from the time dependent part where we're gradually turning on the perturbation so all the transients associated uh, by i'll call it the switching so by turning on the perturbation they've essentially decayed or they've subsided. And in that case, the system has already reached a steady state. Okay. And again, what this means ultimately then is uh, we are justified in sometimes using time independent perturbation theory. Okay, so this was a nice result because our, uh, we've shown that starting from time dependent perturbation theory, we recover similar results or we, um, we've justified our results of time independent perturbation theory. In the next video, we'll uh, consider a very important type of perturbation, which is uh, a harmonically oscillating perturbation, which is uh, extremely important in uh, an experiments is the one that you most often see and is uh, can be the building ground for more general forms of uh, time dependent perturbation.